Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for joining my Zoom chat. And uh, in today's event, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue the discussion on caring for the brush and uh, the Sumia brush. And then uh, when we have time, we'll also talk a little bit about mounting. And then the last part of today's session, we will talk about um, how we're going to celebrate the third year anniversary of the Zhonglo online workshop. So uh, first of all, you know, let me um, just um, say it again. I'm Jung Lok, and uh, thank you everyone for coming to today's Zoom session. So let me um, actually minimize. minimize uh, let me see. I want to. Okay. Yeah, I want to. I want to, you know, like um, make sure that not because some people may be camera shy, right? So, okay, again, um, in our last session, we talk a lot about the Sumie brush, right? And then we talk about the structure, the different in the different kind of hair, and also how to select a good brush. So if you missed the session, go back to YouTube and, um, you know, find the, the last session that I have on Sumie brush, you know, it will have a very detailed explanation. So what we're going to do today is we are going to continue our discussion and talk about how are we going to care for a Sumie brush. And first of all, we also talk about how to open a Sumie brush and then how to care for it. So let's just switch to our camera. Okay, so here I have bought with me free um, a new Sumie brush and um, it does not matter, you know, like what brush you are. And remember in the last session, I did talk about when you buy a brush because they are all round brushes and they're made of natural hair. What you really want to do is you want to make sure you pick one that gathered really to a point. And um, majority of time, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, you will find them, you know, in, in that look like this. They could be covered by a bamboo, um, cover, but then that is actually harder to find out. Now, what they usually do is they are covered in some kind of plastic, all right? And they are removable covers, all right? So, so you will buy them and they are like removable cover. And then when you remove it, what you will find is they have actually a very thin layer of glue that cover or, you know, like they put some glue on top of it after they finish making the brush because they want to make sure during the transportation, they do not flare up. And because of that, in a way, it's very hard for you to tell whether they do gather to a point when it's wet because um, the manufacturer is not going to, or the retailer is not going to let you open it. So I do have to say that, you know, like in a way you do have to trust the retailer or the uh, our supply store that sell you the, the item that is a good reputable um, company that, that get um, good sources, right? Because some of the more inferior one, although they get it to a point, but once you open it, um, they will get it to a point because the glue hold them together. So um, buy high quality brushes. Um, and then when you open them, you know, like after, after you open them, I mean, like when they are naturally dry, um, because there's no glue, so they make sure focus. Um, they, although they do not really, you know, like go to a point. But if you put water, you know, I just put it in some water. You see, it will still gather back to a point, right? So now let's talk about how to open a brush. I have seen multiple. Um, I mean, I I know you know like there are multiple. Um, ways to open brushes and various artists have their favorite way. And I even seen um, people talking about filling your glass with some water, put the brush here and then use some kind of rubber band mm -hmm. or what have you. And then to make the brush kind of stand uh, in the middle and then with the water kind of just touching the tip of the brush and then soak it for like hours or things like that. And I have to say that, you know, like I'm, I'm not against all those methods, right? I mean, like, great, you know, if it works for you, go ahead. But then it sounds too complicated. Um, you know, like um, 
I know many of you are scientists, but then most of us are actually artists. We are lame people that may not may not have you know the technology or the know-how of how to build such a elaborate stand, right? So the easiest way to open a brush is you know like with your source of water. So I just have this little cup. So basically, you just get some clean water, and all you need to do is to put the brush onto the water and let it wet a little bit. I mean, I don't think you need to like, because I mean, the suspension method is to leave it there for like maybe one or two hours or things like that. No need to do that. Okay. I mean, this is brand new. This is, we just poured that in, right? Put that in. What you really want is you want to soften the groove that, that was, you know, along the surface of the hair of the brush during transportation. And you can see, you know, the brush is already losing up, right? And I just did it. I mean, I, I did not do it beforehand. And you can see the brush has already opened up. You see it in the water? The brush has already opened up. So let's get a closer look. Right. The brush has already opened up. And just in case with a few pieces of hair fell off, that's okay. You know, don't worry about it. And with the whole thing fall off, it's different. But but you see that, you know, like when you open it, if you do not get it back to a point, you know, they can, you know, really open up. And this is a brand new brush, by the way. Okay. And occasionally, if you see, like, for example, here, there's a piece of hair that looks kind of loose. You can pull that out. All right, so you can discuss this one, right? So that's it. You have already opened up your brush, all right? So, so you know, like um, if you're using it, great. If you're not using it or you are not immediately using it, um, what you may want to do is, you know, I just use my finger to take out excess water and help it get it back to a point, right? And of course, you can also use a piece of paper or, you know, scrap piece of um, paper or paper towel you know, like absorb, you know, majority of the moisture. And this is already a brush that is open and it's ready to pick up water, pick up color, pick up ink for your calligraphy and your painting. And the same thing with other kind of brushes. Um, for example, you know, I have um, these, both of them are White Cloud. Um, is kind of one of my favorite soft hair brush anyway. So regardless of size, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, I'm just going to open these two brushes as well. So water, and as I say, you know, like there's a thin layer of glue on that. And this is completely new. I, You don't need to soak it or things like that. Just, you know, put it in water. Okay. And with just a larger brush, you know, like it may, it may take a little bit longer. So you may want to like press it a little bit on the side to kind of let the water get in a little bit. But, you know, be patient because basically you want to loosen the groove, right? So you see the, the brushes, the groove is already starting to loosen up. See, this one has already opened up, right? And depending on whether you want to open up all the way to the top or, you know, maybe like one, two third, Right, so this is already loosened up, and just do this, loosen up a little bit more because I like to use the whole brush. Because for some calligrapher, they might only open it up two third. Okay, and then when I'm ready to take it out, I just you know like glide it on the edge of my water container, and some of the water would come up naturally. Of course, you can use your hand to grease it or use a piece of paper towel or paper and just, you know, absorb the extra moisture. And this is a white cloud, a large white cloud. And remember I said that, you know, like sometimes my one of my favorite brushes is kind of like the combination. And you see there are different hair color in there because it's covered by soft hair that is absorbent, but the inside have harder hair that is a darker color. And so it has the um, stiffness in the center as well. So this is a white cloud that I've just opened up. 
So this is ready for usage. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with this one. This is also another white cloud. And the same thing, you just put it in water. It's already open up. It's already open up. And once you open it, glide the excess water out, tap, tap, that is ready for use. So these three brushes are already ready for use. So any questions on opening a brush? You really don't have to soak it in water, okay? So, okay, if there's no questions on opening the brush, then we'll talk about how to maintain the brush, how to, how to make sure you care for the brush. The first thing, um, after you use the brush, of course, you know, you know, like it's common sense, wash all the color and ink away. So, so the same thing here, you know, after you finish using the brush, of course, you, you wash it, you put it in clean water and then you wash it. Make sure that no more color come out. So um, make sure that all the color came out of the brush, right? And after that, what we are going to do is, um, let's look at the brushes again. When it comes to brushes, the brushes usually have two way, the way ends, okay? This one uh, is a cheaper brush, is a, a, a brush that is, you know, like a more affordable and is um, kind of more student grade. So um, there's nothing in the, in the end of, at the end of it, you know, it's just a regular brush, okay. However, for majority of artist brush, a lot of time they would have a little loop here, right? So, so what is this loop for? The loop is to hang the brush up so, so you can, first of all, you can display it, but you can also use it for drying. So here is what I'm going to show you, all right? Um, there may be different stands. Some of them are, you know, more like um, a cross. Some of them are cynical, but basically what this kind of stand is, is that they have little rods or hooks that come out. And what you will do is with the, hooks with the loops here, you just put them, you know, on the loop. So, so when the, the brush is wet, what would happen is the, um, the water will continue to come down. So, so, you know, like the water would not go back the Okay, so this is what you do, but you know, like um, with I mean, there are there are um artists who are very particular with their brush. So um, and other you know, if you are really meticulous, is what you do is um, you clean the brush, you put it to dry, and then maybe twenty minutes later or half an hour later, you come back here and then you wash it again because technically, all the semi dirty water or water that have a little bit of ink will continue to come down to the tip and then you wash it again. You also kind of get the second wash of the dirty water out. And if you're really, really particular about that, then you can come back and wash it again when, in water. But basically you let you let all the dirty water come down. All right. So this is, you know, kind of like a way to to, you know, kind of like take advantage of the hook so you can have it in a hanging position. And in, I mean, you don't have to buy something like this. You can have, you know, maybe a rod and have little hooks screw on to that, then you can hang it up. And um, so so it doesn't have to be expensive, both. but basically the, the typical way of uh, kind of like displaying and um, storing the brush is to actually hang that up, you know, like, like this, All right? Joan, so, yes. Joan, yes, um, for a more, in a, inexpensive way i i actually went to now i forget whether it's a Hob, hobby lobby or mm -hmm. michaels to their jewelry section and and, and picked up a, a jewelry holder like a necklace holder oh yes and i, and I use that so uh, obviously it's got a certain length to it but i put like something else under the stand so that the stand is higher you know because if you yes. have some very long brushes it would go yes. past the stand but yes, anyhow, because because necklace holders do have a lot of hooks across. You're right. Yeah, that that's yes. a that's so, a really ingenious way. 
because um as I said, you know, this is one of the one that I have. Um, I also have one that is across. Uh, the reason why these are expensive is because these are these accessories. These are mainly made of rosewood, and so they are expensive wood to begin with. And you know, this one I actually got it with a set of um other brushes, but then the other one that I have, you know, that is horizontal, you know, go across. That one have dragon carving on both sides, so um, so so they could be expensive because of the carving and also the quality of the wood. So so these kind of um stand, uh, especially the one that go across. Um, I don't think they sell cheaper than seventy dollar, and um, it could go up because of the way it's carved and things like that. As a matter of fact, I remember um when my mentor was alive um in for his either 80th birthday um I think our, I mean the student of his we we pulled together and actually bought him a very nice stand so so you can imagine you know like those stands are not cheap <laughs> uh but then uh, a jewelry hook uh um uh could do it or even you can buy those little hooks um in a hardware store you know it could cost maybe cost maybe like twenty uh two dollars you just put it on a piece of wood and then you just hang it on the wall. And, you know, like it, it could be a lot of different ways. Okay, now how about those that doesn't have a hook? Of course, you can put a loop to it. But then another way to store it is, first of all, what not to do, okay? Um, when you are painting, don't do this, all right? Because I know that especially for oil painter, since oil, you know, if you let it dry, it may ruin the brush. And when they are still, you know, switching, between different um, colors. Sometimes they'll put it on turpentine or some kind of solvent to ensure that the, the hair doesn't dry it up. So that is kind of like a common uh, habit. So so if you see how an oil painter paint, sometimes they'll just even put several of this onto you know, some kind of solvent. Uh, and then uh, that could also be true for acrylic painter because you don't want the acrylic to dry. And for watercolorless, um, I don't see it as often, but then I sometimes do still, still see it. They just put it there. Don't do it because majority of time when you put that in, the water is deeper than the length of the hair. So not just the hair, but then the entire portion is being soaked. And the danger is the way these hair are together are two things. They do have groove on the bottom, and then they do have some kind of mechanism, whether it is wire or thread um, to cram it together. However, um, by soaking it, moisture can go in and damage it. The moisture can also loosen the groove. So you will have hair fall out. So, and then you will also promote the rotting of this. So, so don't put it in the water soaking when you are painting. And when you finish, or when you finish um, uh, painting, say for example, I I use this brush. I finish, um, you know, after I you know pick up my color and then I paint something, um, because I mean, some of you who have ex especially see my um, flower demo, when I do a petal, I have a brush for the petal, and then when I do the leaves, I have another brush for the leaf, and you know, there, there are good reasons for it because I don't want to keep washing and changing from um, red to green and then green to red and red to green again. Uh, it not only wastes paint, but also contaminate um, the color and also, um, you know, like have a hard time picking up the same green. But if I have a separate brush for green and separate brush for red, it will be different. But then I will be doing the red and then the green and then the red and the green and things like that. Because of that, you know, like the brush, may not be washed and I'm not done with the paint yet. So what I'll do is I will just leave it, but not on the water, of course, not hanging up. So what I'm going to do is I will have a stand or something. I mean, if you really have to, you can leave it on the paper, but then the paper or the paper tower would be soaking up all the paint and you are not only wasting the paint, but you're also making your desktop pretty dirty. So what I'll do is I'll put it on the side, on the edge of the plate, or better yet, I will have some kind of brush stand, all right? So um, brush stand come in all different style. It can even be, you know, something that 
that you you can use a chopstick stand or you know this is actually the just the cover for the for the brush but but something that you can put it up so it won't be soaking the surface yeah. and ideally it would be like a little brush stand that that is this one is good because it's actually hold it horizontally not even at an angle right so so you do that and then when I have to pick up another color I'll do that and when I'm all done when I'm all done then I'll wash it up but basically they are stored horizontally or at a very slight tilted angle just to make sure that this is not touching the um, paper but basically what I want to say is you really don't want moisture to go into it and ink and color also if it go really to the root of it it can damage it as well and I think you know like um many of you have taken my flower lessons when I low flowers in different colors you probably notice that I always wet it with water and then the color are usually to two third or one third or even just the tip. I seldom ask you to have everything on the entire brush because in a way the last quarter or the last third of the brush, this much, this, this much, usually they only water. Because even you only have water by, by the time you color two third um, uh, where, uh, of the brush has two third color, the color will, you know, kind of go up a little bit. So one way or the other, you really don't want a lot of color to be on this because it's very hard to wash out. And you don't want that because um, what happened is color and ink, color and ink, when it dry, I mean, like if you put it on the plate and when it dry, it, it become brittle. And because the pigment, you know, the, the particle in the pigment, the Ink, ink is actually carbon particle, you know, the, the, the carbon particle in the ink. I mean, when it's completely dry, it, it hold on to the hair and it will make it brittle. And then when you make it brittle, when you use it again, it can easily fall off. So in a way, if you don't wash your, wash, your brush uh, completely, you will also promote the breaking of the hair, losing of the hair of the brush because they were dirty and then they just fall off because when the ink and the color are dry, it just makes the hair brittle and it fall off. So, so you know, like um, um, store it, don't put it in water, um, let it um vertically hang down with not at least put it horizontally. Okay, now storage. I think you know most of you have this. This is um this is actually store bought, so you can buy them in um supply store that sells Sumier. As a matter of fact, this is so popular. Actually, if you go to a regular art supply store or even um, hobby store, you know they will sell it as well. Even they don't sell a lot of Sumier items. What they are, they are bam, these are actually small pieces of bamboo. And the advantage of small pieces of bamboo are twofold. First of all, you will see that it's kind of see-through, right? So it's not solid. It's not a solid piece of plastic or anything it's actually bamboo um so it's um it can be ventilated you know um so when you put your brush and you roll it up it's not really rolling up on a, for example like a piece of plastic it can breathe so if it is not completely dry yet it can still continue to dry all right so so it's kind of ventilated because it's it's not a hundred percent waterproof all right but then Another good thing is because it's made of bamboo, it's actually stiff. I mean, you can't really bend it, right? And the good thing of this is, um, of course, you buy that that is longer than your brush. So when you put that here, let's go back to the camera. When you when you saw your brush, let's bring some more. When you saw your brush, you just leave it here. And then usually, they, regardless of you know how long it is, usually one side you will you will add a piece of string or um a, a rope to it, and basically you you can roll that up, okay. Depending on how much storage space, some people like to roll it flat like this. Some people like for me, I like to roll it up in a circle, so I roll it up like that, and then basically you just use your thread. And then you tie it up. I mean, some people like to tie it and 
do a knock and things like that. What I like to do is usually they will come with a little bit of um, kind of like an anchor, okay? And then I just oh, roll. Bye -bye. And then after I roll, after I rolled, when it's almost to the end, I basically just tuck it right in. And that's it. You know, it it um is a lot easier than to untie a knock, right? So you just pick it up, put it down, right? And that's it, right? And of course, you know, like I have old one that I use so much that, you know, like uh, the um, the fret fall off and you know this fell off and you just you just fix it all right but basically the good thing is because it's stiff and it will not damage the hair when you are when you are transporting it when you put it in a travel um a duffel bag in your luggage in your um you know like pan air um backpack and things like that you know and and, and stuff like yeah. that so um uh any question on storage <clears throat> Hello. Okay. Okay. With not then, I also want to talk about the um fixing of brushes that are falling apart. All right. Let's talk about this one. This this one. Uh, that's a story to this brush. Okay. Um, let me do this. Okay. All right. Okay. If if you want to talk, just unmute yourself. All right. So this is a um a brush. It's a mountain horse by a company called Sang Fai Tong, which is no longer in business. And I got this thirty plus years ago from my mentor and teacher Mu Fong Yun. Um, there's a story about this brush because um, if you have a copy of my album, uh, and um. Go to the last page of the um, Voice of America interview. I actually talk about that story of uh, Mr. Fong Yun in giving me different kind of brushes, and this is um it's a longer story to that because when he gave me the brushes, um the brushes are all new except this one because this is a mountain horse brush. It's necessary to have this brush for the painting of bird wings in the Ningnan style. When he gave it to me. He told me to use his brushes. And he also told me that um, he's sorry that this one is used because he cannot find another one in his collection. He gave me his. And um, I was so touched by it. But um, so this actually belonged to my mentor, Fang Yuning. And um, I've been treasuring this brush for the longest time. And then since I used it for 30 plus years, it's falling apart. And one day, all the hair kind of fall off because this um this particular part, you know, like where where they are connected, it was so old, the hair actually kind of fall off. So guess what I did? I gathered it together. Actually, a photo of it. I I don't know where I put it. Maybe I'll I'll show, share it to you with you guys later. I stuck that way back in. I put some glue on the bottom. And then I use a piece of thread and then I tie it back up again. So it's a bit narrower than what it used to be because this amount, this amount of is actually a back piece of thread that I added. Okay, it's because it usually should come to here. But but anyway, I actually amended my um small mountain horse. This is I think it's a small free mountain horse. And I'm I'm still using this for my little bird. Um, wings Ningnan style so you can fix it um, not ideally you know like you kind of expect it to be back to the normal um, um, uh, efficiency but then you know like you don't have to throw it away and then of course um, like this is the one that we just opened there's a new one and you see that you know besides the glue sometimes they have a piece of thread that tie it together and this is what I did on this one. This is a um, long throw. I mean, it's an extremely old brush. Um, I like it. So uh, when the hair is falling apart, I mean, actually sometimes not the hair, but the whole thing fall off. You put it back in, you tuck it right back in, you put some glue on it. And then what I did is I use a red thread and I just tied it and, you know, force it 
to be together and let it completely dry. And I have to say that when you put something back together, you probably may not be able to get it back to get it to a point. However, then I can use it for something else. I probably would not use it for flower petal anymore, but then I can use it for some really cool texture stroke. And um, I'm sure that you know many of you who come to my, um, oh yeah, dental force would be a good one too. Um, uh, sometimes, um, especially when you come to my landscape lessons in the supply list, uh, when they ask you, you know, what brushes do I use? And I say, I use all small and medium and large Sumie brushes because that's really what I do. Um, I show you some of my uh, brushes here. Okay, um, when when you have a brush that you like, you buy multiple ones, right? <laughs> so this is a um, orchid bamboo. This is a medium orchid bamboo, and you can tell this is exactly the same brush, right? I mean, I I may have some different markings just to you know let me differentiate, especially when I'm in a hurry and trying to pick up something, but then. Is the exact same brush is a medium sized orchid bamboo, right? And it is manufactured in China, um, Chengdu, you know. So, so this is from China. Chengdu is a medium orchid bamboo, and it's the exact same brush. So the structure is all the same, and you can tell um, this is the oldest one. This is the oldest one because this is it's actually this one is uh, almost brand new this one i just opened it maybe like maybe you know a few weeks ago so this is a uh, uh, almost new and um you know you you know that i i mark my brushes so you know when i go to workshop you know there will be no argument of brushes especially because when i when i teach workshop uh, in the practice session, I usually bring my brush and then walk around. And occasionally when I'm helping my student with things, sometimes I finish painting, I leave it on the table and I forget to pick that up. And by having, you know, like very unique uh, marking, um, you know, like it, there will not be any confusion as to, you know, whether it's the student brush or my brush and, and things like that. And besides, I mean, you probably know that it's a Hello Kitty. So I don't think, I have not seen another artist that put Hello Kitty on their brush. So Hopefully there would not be any misunderstanding. But anyway, you see that I have different markings. And then, you know, this is the newest, latest one. And then I also put another marking, which is kind of like a, um, a I mean, another green color. And what it does is it tells me this brush is mine. This one is for flowers. So, so I will not use it for leaves. I will use it for stem. This will only go for flower petals because I want my best brush for flower petals because my flower petals, sometimes each petal is done by one stroke. I want it to have good volume, good resilience, good gathering of a point. And that's why this brush is only for flower petal for now, all right? And then this one, this one, I also have an auto marking. This one actually is for leaves. I even wrote it down, L-E-A-F, you know, leaf. So, so this one is a older one. It's the same brush, but it's older. So a lot, some of hair has been lost and I'm going to use it for leaves. And then for this one, this one is kind of like the olders. And then what I did is I actually have a, um, a marking and this actually say landscape use. So I'm going to use this for landscape because for landscape, sometimes I'm really rough. I'm sometimes for making rocks and texture. I, you know, like use the brush in a very, um, you know, like kind of like a, a expressive way, you know, things like that. So the exact same brush, but then I'll use it for different things. And you can see, um, you know, like when, when you need to and you have to correct it or fix it, then it doesn't get it back to a point. You can always use it for landscape, all right? So that's um, about the brushes. Any questions on what I cover so far on brushes? Storage, opening, and um, fixing. I have to say that, you know, like, uh, I usually don't fix a brush. I'll just kind of like promo it to my landscape pile, but then, that particular um, 
uh, mountain horse brush has meaning. And so so I, I fix it and continue to use it. It's not like I, I don't have another small free mountain horse. I, I just kind of like, you know, it's, it's a sentimental value, right? So um, any questions on brushes? With not, um, I have a um, request on the um, bleeding of um, uh, colors during mounting. So um, I'm going to just quickly show you what I do, okay? I just have some, you know, like um, painting. I mean, like we, this is not a, not a, um, I mean, I'm not covering how to mount, all right? So, so we're not going to talk about that. But then when we are mounting, we have a piece of rice paper. Let's just get a random piece of rice paper. Okay, we have a piece of rice paper. We have the things to be mounted. We have it upside down. I mean, like, of course, weathered and have glue and things like that. Let's say this one has where it has all the glue and things like that, right? And then you put it onto your mounting paper. Okay, what, what my student tell me is that sometimes the color bleed out, especially with this is a red color, such as the crown of a rooster, really bright flower like this one. Sometimes the color bleed out, right? Maybe like I I'll promote the bleeding so you can see it, say. Like sometimes the color bleed out. So how do we avoid it in the mounting process, right? So this is what I would do, right? First of all, always wait before you mount. Make sure the, the papers not only completely dry, but like wine, leave it for two weeks, a month, two months, before you mount to ensure that this is really dry. And I know that with you are, um, for example, we have a show to enter and you have nothing, but then you make something immediately and then you want to put it in, then you don't have the luxury of waiting. But then um, with you can afford it, actually wait. Um, I myself, because I don't enjoy mounting. So I myself do not mount every month. I mount only when I have to. And because when I only have to, so what I do is when I have painting, for example, in in the back, you know, only this one is mounted. All these have not been mounted. And I'll just leave it there. Even it's, a, it's an artwork that I like, for example, this, I mean, like if I don't like, I won't put it on the wall. So, I mean, I like them all. So I'm not going to put them in the garbage can. I like them all. But then, you know, when I, when I have someone that say, hey, Jong, you know, like uh, I have a show, you know, do you have, um, night blooming cactus, you know, so I'm like, hey, I have one, let me just frame this one, then I will mount it, and this one could have been painted three months ago, four months ago, and things like that, that would be better to mount, because you want to make sure it's completely dry, all right, after that, okay, first of all, make sure it's completely dry, so I recommend you actually paint a lot, and leave it for months before you mount, all right, so that's the first part, of course, the second part is make sure that, you know, like you use good paint and all those things and, you know, we're not going into that. But when you are mounting, the color come out usually of two reasons. The, the color come out either is actually the, the color, come, because I'm, I'm actually promoting the, the bleeding of the color. The color come out because the water on the paper or the glue on the paper is actually dissolving whatever you have on the paper. And then when you are wetting it, because this, this um, watercolor get kind of activated again, so there is a puddle of say orange water on top of this when you are, when you are wetting it with the glue. So when you pick that up and put it onto a backing paper, what happened is we want to kill all the bubbles, right? So when we want to kill all the bubble, you you want to get all the air out. So in a way, even we do it like um, even we do it like right side 
um, down, if we do this, you know, in force, right? We do it, and by doing this, the color water that is on top of your paper get pushed. You see, the water that is on top get pushed. So therefore, you know, because I'm pushing down, it come down here, right? So when you have something that a very bright color or you just painted or, or only rest for like one or two weeks, there's a danger of this still being activated and the color water is resting here. So what I would recommend you to do or with you, with you kind of are very skeptical that, you know, let me just wet this again to, to kind of make that happen again. When you are putting your uh, backing paper on top, instead of just pushing in one direction to get all the air bubble out, be a little bit more gentle, especially on the area that you kind of know that that's where the red is. And instead of pushing out, push inward towards the flower, I mean, meaning that instead of pushing out, actually push inward. And, and hopefully your painting, um, for example, with a group of flower, you know, like push it inward instead of push to the white area, because with this and say, for example, there are two flowers, with this, even when it bleed, it bleed to another flower, it would not be as obvious, right? And then the last but not least, after that, you know, like, because as I say, the water, since there are still water on top and the, the paint has been kind of reactivated and then the water, the moisture have some of this orange pigment on it. So after you push all the air bubble out, and you know, like um, for example, this side, this side, you know, like there's no um lead bleeding. However, when it dry, you know, the water can come out this way. So one trick, which is a trick that um, you know, even professional monitors would do is in the olden times, we still read newspaper. I know that you know, like we don't really use physical newspaper anymore. So there's no newspaper at home. So you can use newsprint, right? This is a piece of newsprint. So what a professional mounting person would do, I mean, I I know what they do is after this is dry, but by the way, there's no glue here, right? Because the glue is between this and the backing sheet, there's only water here. What they would do is they would put a piece of newspaper on top of the painting. And don't push or don't, don't use a uh, brush and bit push. But basically, they'll put a piece of newspaper on top, either on the entire painting or on the area. Say, for example, this is, um, this is the petal that I'm most concerned. They'll put a piece of newspaper on top and then leave it to dry. And what does it do? What it does is in case with the moisture that has the orange pigment is creeping out and want to go into this area that are white, this newspaper would have absorbed it during the drying process. And, and because, you know, like sometimes we have really big painting, um, instead of doing an entire piece of Newspaper, because newspaper is only a particular size, but I have to say that, you know, for a professional mounting company, um, the painting that they have to mount is even bigger than the newspaper. So they don't cover the whole painting. They only cover the area that they know there's a danger of leaking. They just put it on top of that and then leave it to dry. And technically, with there's no glue, when the painting dry, you can easily peel off the paper and there will have a little bit of reddish or orange hood here because they cut, it absorbed the moisture, but then the, the paper would still have crisp lines. So that's the way. So in case, in case, for example, you know, one of, one of us, you know, I, I won't name you, but one of you will have um, a rooster painting 
everything is you know like beautiful but then the the crown of the rooster is really really red and for whatever reason maybe you you really want to bring it to the easter gathering or there's a uh, art auction and you must finish the painting before before tuesday to to submit it and things like that and you must mount it now um with this is the one area get a piece of newsprint slightly bigger than the size and just stick it right there and when the whole thing dry it should be able to peel off and the excess, excess color moisture will be here and this will have still have a crisp mark. But then I think most of the time, because this is, as I said, this is the trick I'm sharing with you. But most of the time, the reason is when the water, we activated the paint. And then when we were pushing the air bubble out, sometimes we push too hard. We push, you know, like all the way out and all the, all the paint get pushed to a particular size and, and got out. So that's that's how you know you can avoid the bleeding. So any questions on what I just show you? Do you find it helpful? Okay. Last but not least, I'm closing to my hour. I know some of you are coming to my um night blooming cactus class. By the way, it's a it's a really good class because I'm actually going to cover the white powder coalition, which is a um a very cool technique in Ningnan style. So whoever didn't sign up, you miss it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, the um, birth anniversary um, presentation, I want to cover the art of the Gold Brothers, the founders of the Ningnan Art Association, I mean, the, the founders of the Ningnan School of Art. And um, let me, you know, like you can email me with comments. Any particular um, suggestions on the question that I asked you? Do you want to include Chen, who is also, you know, the, the remaining finder? Do you want me to cover more the art than the life? Or, you know, I mean, do you mind if I extend it to another hour and, and things like that? Any, any questions and comments before I close today's Zoom chat? If you have any comment, just um, give me the answers um, via an email. And um, I have to say that because this is for the anniversary, I, um, I will um, make a pretty nice presentation. And I want to make sure that uh, we'll do the art of the Gold Brother justice. So I hope you will not miss this because I want to clarify, you know, various kinds of um, misunderstanding about the class, uh, the, the, the class of Ningnam art. And other thing is, um, I also want to um, let people know, you know, like not only are these um, great artists, um, they have really interesting life and then they are actually um, revolutionary heroes um, of the um, liberation of uh, China from imperial rule. So, so those are, you know, things that I think is very valuable for people to know um, It's just, part of history that um, could be a nice cultural, um, informative, educational session. So um, any questions before we end today's class? Okay. With not, I'll see you um, around an hour in the uh, Nice Booming Conquest workshop. Thank you everybody for joining me.